Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right. Acts chapter 19. You know, it says here that, that uh, Paul passed to the upper coast of Ephesus, finding that certain disciples said, hey, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That's not our sermon, but that's a good question. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said, well, you have not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said, which baptism were you baptized? They said, John's. Paul said, John barely baptized the baptism unto repentance, that they should believe on him that come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. Glory to God. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers, that means different people, were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that uh, way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, discussing daily in the school of one Tyrannus, and continued by the space of two years, so that all that which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought from upon unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Hallelujah. I tell you, there's, God still uses that method today. Uh, we, we've had, in the past year, we've had some notable, and we're not talking, you know, somebody got healed of a headache, you know, and we thank God for people getting healed of headaches. But we're talking stage four cancers of people who sent home to die and had eight days to live, or, or walking in, and at work today. Hallelujah, the lady earlier this year, to stage two breast cancer. After went back to the doctor, after got the prayer call, went back to the doctor, and they couldn't find anything. They just could not explain what happened. Amen. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> and over the years, our ministries have that, has had an earmark along those lines. We've had notable, notable miracles. Hallelujah. Just like this, God brought special miracles. We, I actually prayed over a, hand, a candy one time because they couldn't get the, the prayer cloth into the, the place where the woman was. Hallelujah. And, and they got delivered. Tuberculosis. People heal tuberculosis. That's not easy. God healed tuberculosis. Anything's easy for God, but in the natural realm, it's not always easy. We've had these things happen numerous times. Glory to God. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. You know, you know, second, secondhand information don't work in the kingdom. You got to know it for yourself. And there were, one, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirits was leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. There's a lot of ungodly stuff going on around there. Now listen to the next verse. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now I wanted, to, I wanted to read the first part of this chapter because I wanted to set the stage as to why there was the ability for the word of God to grow and prevail. Notice they were penitent. They were penitent. They, they, they confessed this. They, they believed. They brought all their arts. They brought everything and burned it. They were in a, they were in a mindset of, of humbling themselves and being penitent before the Lord. All right? God does not work real good with the proud, lifted up, and arrogant. The I know it all. I know more than the pastor. I know more than the leadership. I know more than everybody. You know, I got the answer. I can be arrogant. I can be dis, disrespectful. I can do this. God doesn't work real good in that arena. Well, God could do anything. He, if he could, he could make you pay your tithe. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what Brother Hagin said. That was a... <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, if God could do anything, we everybody would be saved and we'd all be in heaven tomorrow. He can't override people's will. Amen? And he doesn't work good in an atmosphere of, of arrogance. 
And I, I believe one of the things we're dealing with in the church today <coughs> is a mindset that we know, more than, we, know, we know more than God. We know more than leaders. We know more people who've been around, you know, doing things for a long time. Uh, there, there's just this mindset. You know, just because it's young and cool doesn't mean it's right. I don't mind young and cool as long as it's right. But just because it's young and cool don't make it right. Okay? You know, oh, well, it's, it's just because it's hot, just because people are buying the books, just because people are watching the programs, just because people throw money at something doesn't make it right. There's been a lot of books sold on, on things that weren't even biblical. But people, because it had a cool title, because it, it, it appealed to their flesh, people just ran after it. No, we have to stay humble before the Lord. We have to remain teachable. Amen. Amen. We have to remain teachable and humble. Now here, we find that there was a penitent atmosphere. Uh, Paul had preached, been there, there uh, in one, you know, two, over two years. Then the special miracles, then the, then the vagabonds tried to show up and say, hey, we, we got it going on. We can get this thing done too, you know, and it didn't work. We adjure you whom, by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. I mean, you know, they don't know their head from a hole in the ground. They don't know Jesus. They just heard it worked. That's just like people who come in and hear us saying, I believe that I receive my healing according to the word of God. And they all going to copy that and get healed. No, because they don't believe it. They're just mimicking something. They're, being, they're, just, they're just rehearsing what they've heard somebody else do, but there's not a personal knowledge. There's not an intimate knowledge. There's not, there's, there's not revelation or faith in them. And so what happened to those guys? They got whooped, sent out of the house naked. And everybody around the place heard about what happened. And, they, and boy, it, it, brought, it really brought a sense of the power and majesty of God to where people began to, to get right and to bring things and clear things up out of their lives. Uh, apparently, some of these people believe and they start bringing all their stuff get it out of their lives, to get right with God. And when they got in that place, when they got in that place of, of, a, of a penitent mindset, a humility before the Lord, the Word of God grew and prevailed. In other words, the soil was right. They had cultivated it properly. It was ready to grow. Can you say amen? amen. So I, I believe that what we need to see in the church is more people who, are, who, who keep themselves, well, not more, everybody needs to be humble, keep themselves humble before the Lord. Now, I, I can tell you, I remember back in the early days of our word of faith circles, boy, we thought we knew everything. We are the only ones. I guess you probably find out by now, you're not the only one, don't know everything. <laughs> Amen? You know a lot, but you don't know everything. Amen? And you'll even find out people who don't have all the revelation you have in some areas got more revelation in other areas than you do. Amen. So what do we do? We just go ahead and grab a hold of what we can get, and eat the hay, leave the stubble, and go forward. And keep a humble heart. Keep a, keep a humility about us uh, with dealing with other people. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Keep, keep a proper attitude uh, because we're here to help people, not hurt them. We're here to bless them, not be, you know, show them that we know more, that we're better. Halty arrogance will get you in trouble. Now, so let's, let's keep the right attitudes about the things of God. So in this attitude, so we're, we're, one thing we're going to do, we're going to say our attitude has to stay humble. Say my attitude has to stay humble before the Lord and before man. Amen. Glory to God. God wants his word to grow in you. God wants his word to prevail in you. God wants his word to, to gain ascendancy in your entire life. So let's talk about this. The word of God. So look at Hebrews chapter 4. It says this, the word of God is quick. Now that's, that's, you know, we're using the King James, so that's old Elizabethan for a lie or a living thing. The, the, the word of God is a living thing and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, uh, uh, even to, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of morrow, and listen to this, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now let me say something here. You're getting counsel from people, and it's not the Word of God. It's not going to discern the thoughts and intents of your heart. Somebody say amen. amen. It's the Word of God that discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I've said this before. You know, that they're, they're, the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. And I, I'm always amazed by the people who when they, when they get into a disagreement with some, or especially when it comes with churches and stuff, you go go to people who don't like the church and get their counsel. 
Go ahead, dummy. That was humble on my part right now. I, I, I want to be stronger than dummy, but I'll just stay with dummy. Go listen to somebody who thinks Christians are a, are a bunch of thieves, thinks Christians are liars, thinks Christians are mean, and you're going to go get counsel for them. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get the wisdom of this world, earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, if, you need, if you're going to get help from people, you've got to get help from people who know the word and give you the word and give you the word of God in the right attitude and the spirit of love and reconciliation and restoration and not one of, you know, uh, they, they don't like the church because they got hurt by the church or something somewhere. A lot of people get hurt because they're walking around with a chip on their shoulder. Amen. 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 You walk around with a, with, a, with a chip on your shoulder, daring people to knock it off, somebody's going to knock it off. That's just the way it works. Hello? Because there's just somebody honor enough that you put it up there, they're going to knock it off. Amen? So what do we do? The Word of God is alive. Come on now. The Word of God is alive. And I'll be quite honest with you. I, I remember something that Dad Hagen said. Um, now, I, I believe, I believe in, in ministering to people and counseling with people as, as needed. But I'll tell you something. Dad Hagen said this. He used to have people come say, well, I need, Brother Hagen, I need counseling. He said, fine. He said, but well, what we're going to do is for the next six weeks, we're going to come out here on Thursday night or whatever. You're going to meet with me during the day or whatever. And we're going to come down to the altar and pray for an hour. And after that, we'll talk. You know what he said? He never had to counsel any of those people because after the six weeks, they said, I got my answer. What? They got it in prayer with the Spirit. Amen. Now, you understand, I'm not talking, you know, don't, don't, don't go taking this any other way than it's being said. We need to be spending more time looking to the answers from heaven because heaven has answers in the word for your life. Amen. This is in every arena of life, in your finances, in, your, in, in, uh, in, in how you deal with this and how you deal with that. The word of God has your answers. Somebody say the word of God has your answers. Has All right. The word of God has your answers. And so we, when, we, when we take time and give ourselves over to the word of God and to the spirit of God, he will begin to minister to us in a realm deeper than our soulless realm. He'll get into our spirit. And he'll produce life in us. And that life will filter up. And that life will begin to speak into our soulless realm. Where that life of God begins to bring correction and adjustment and thought uh, and, and filter thoughts. But you've got to have that word in you. Say the word got to be in me. And so then we become doers of the word and not hearers only. Can you say amen? amen. So the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. One of the worst things we can do is get somebody to give us something other than the word. Amen. Amen. Now I've got I've got relatives. Anybody got, anybody got relatives? How many got relatives? Raise your hand if you got relatives. All right. And sometimes relatives do stuff and you go, man, I wish I didn't have Facebook. Because I wish I wouldn't have my name adjacent to them. And their list of friends, you know, such and such relative. You, you, some of you got relatives. Now, now, and, my, and of course, in, in my line, we got redneck relatives. Hello? Yeah. And they'll get on the internet and, and run off and spout all this stuff out because they've been listening. Somebody give them stuff, and I'm thinking, my God, just shut up. You know? And then next minute, they're talking about the Lord's good to them. <laughs> now, wait a second. Now, now. No, just shut up. What did the Bible say about all that stuff you just ran your mouth off about? No, we got, we got to let the, let the word discern our heart, the intents. And it's got to separate it from your soul. Your soul will get you in trouble. If you do not bring into captivity thoughts through the obedience of Jesus Christ, your soul will get you in trouble. Get out the Nerf guns and shoot me and get it out of your system. Come on. All right, everybody say this. I am listening with a receptive heart. My mind is alert. It is letting the Spirit of God speak to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Why? Because what I'm saying can help you. Throughout your life, what I'm saying will help you. You always let the Word of God work in you. Everybody in this room has got emotions. How many got emotions? You get angry, you cry, you get ticked off, you get this. Your emotions can go all over the place. <clears throat> You've got to learn to control that. And the only way you're going to learn to control that is live out of your spirit, not out of your, out of your soul. All right. Jesus said in John 6, 63, 
The spirit quickens or makes alive. The flesh, listen, the flesh profits nothing. Like I said, I got some relatives I can tell when they've been talking to people at work. They'll come on, get on the internet and start saying all kinds of stupid stuff. And you're thinking, where did you get that from? Because I know you know better. They've been talking to folks at work. I'll tell you what I would do. Save it. I look at your life. I know what's going on in your life. Amen. I mean, I've had people tell me, you know, if I was pastor and had to put up with some of that, da, 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 I would do this. But you're not pastor. You, don't, you, don't even pa you hadn't even pastor. How do you know I'm a, what I'm supposed to do? Give me some Bible and I'll listen to that. But don't just give me your opinion. Well, I'll tell you what I would do. Well, what, is it, what, what does the Word say I should do? Because yeah. your counsel means nothing without what the Word says. Now, if you can substantiate it and undergird it with the, what, what the Bible says, then your counsel is, is useless to me. Can I get three bobbleheads? All right. Hallelujah. And so, we, we're here we are the word, the, the flesh profits nothing. Say, my flesh profits me nothing. How you feel about it profits you nothing. I don't care if you got bumps, you know, chills ran up down your spine. I've been to the theater before and they played some horror movie and I got chills. It wasn't the Holy Ghost either. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever been moved by some patriotic song? Don't mean it was the Holy Ghost. All right? Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein how often? Day and night, that you may observe to do according to what? According to what? All that's written therein. Remember this penitent crowd who came and humbled themselves before God, the word of God grew. And prevailed. Why? Because they let the word of God begin to govern what they said, what they did, how they thought, how they acted. Yeah. Uh, people don't like to hear that. I don't got times I don't like to hear it. But it's still true. Yeah. Hello. Sometimes you want to be honorary. I don't have a scripture that says don't be honored, but I got a scripture that says walk in love. <laughs> I wish, you know, sometimes you wish there weren't scriptures in some places. There's times you want to do stuff, then you go find, then the scripture comes up. The Holy Ghost is it going, hey, the Bible says this. Yes. And how many of you ever wanted to, yeah, but the Holy Ghost? <laughs> yeah, but. You know, there are no yeah, buts for the believer when the word of God is involved. When the Word of God becomes involved and the Spirit of God's bringing that to you, or God's using the pastor to say something to you, or God's using another believer and that's giving you the Word, can you say amen? amen. Now, when believers start coming to you and telling you, yeah, well, I just think. Have you ever had somebody tell you, I just think? And basically in those words, not maybe, maybe a different word, but that's, that's what they're saying. Yeah, but I just think. I don't give a rip what you think. Why? Because what you think is irrelevant to my life when the Word of God has something to say to me as a believer. We got, we got people going around the Bible clearly without any inhibitions, prohibits, disdains, and even calls those who, are, uh, who, 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 who um, yield themselves to a homosexual spirit an abomination. And yet you got Christians that go around saying, well, I just think we need to love people. They need to be able to marry somebody if they want to marry somebody. Not according to this, so I don't care what you think. Amen. And your counsel is ungodly counsel. Amen. It is earthly sensual. Why? Well, because the Bible says something different. Yeah, but we live in different times. It doesn't matter what time we live in. God does not change. God did not change just because it got to be a modern society. God didn't change just because somebody passed a law or some liberal a demon possessed judge said it was okay. Amen. Didn't make God's word any less valid just because a man d d contradicts it. Amen. And then we pick that up and we sound cool to society. But what does what spirit operates in society? The spirit of come on, guy, this world. 
And what is the wisdom of this world? Earthly, sensual, and devilish. Yeah, but you know, the Bible says to walk in love. I don't have time to go down that whole path. I mean, if you think that love is a catch-all for doing anything the Bible says you're not supposed to do, an excuse to do anything the Bible says not to do, you're wrong. <clears throat> I said, you're wrong. Love sent Jesus to redeem you from that behavior, not to encourage it. Somebody, y'all need to be talking to me here. And so there's all kinds of things that people have going on in their lives that if we would just take a step back, stop getting opinions from the news, stop getting opinions from friends, stop getting opinions from disgruntled Christians, and go get a hold of what the Word of God says and see what the Bible says about things, and then let it prevail in us, it will radically change our life and, and set us free and keep us on the right path. Because the Word of God has answers. To everything in your life. From finances. to I mean the whole gamut. We can go finances. How to live. We got whole churches now. That call themselves homosexual churches. And I think. How do you do that? Well here's how they do it. They go out. They say. Well when these, the Bible was being translated. This, they, they made it. They changed. What they saying? The Bible was changed. To establish this anti-homosexual behavior. So they're rewriting the Bible in their teaching. Maybe not writing it, but in their teaching, they're rewriting it and saying that God really didn't prohibit it. He, he allows it. And if you take anything away from this Bible or add anything to, let you be a cursed anathema. That is not a blessed title. Anathema carries a very strong condemnation tone to it. And in, 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 in interpretation, it doesn't carry, you know, well, just let me get a little slap on this. It's anathema. It is, it is banished. It is, it's bad. You can't rewrite the Bible to fit what you want to do. And you just can't use certain scriptures to get away with what you want to do. We had to let the whole counsel of the word of God, this book of the law, the whole counsel of the word of God. Everybody say the whole counsel. Shall so not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate there and how often? Day and night. Why? That you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. For when? What? Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success or deal wisely in the affairs of life. The word of God has to be our standard bearer. Has to be our guide. Has to be. That's actually more than our guide. It's not just a guide in our life. It is the foundation of our life. Remember Jesus talking about the man, the two men, one that built the house. Remember that. He who builds his house, you know, he who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I like him into a man who went and digged in the sand and built his house. And the winds came, the storm, the the, the storm came, the winds blew, the the waves beat vehemently upon the house, and great was the fall of it. Amen. But he who heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. I likened him to a man who went and dig deep and built his house on the rock. And the storm came and the winds blew and the waters beat upon that house. And it stood. Amen. Hallelujah. So you've got to build on the foundation of God's word. We can, so it has to be the foundation of our life. The word of God has to be the very foundation by which we live or we will, we will fall. And anything other than the word of God becomes sand. Everybody say sand. The Word of God becomes anything. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That's good. There we go. Open back up. I said open. Sesame. There we go. My, my, my iPod did something weird. So the Word of God, it first going to prevail in us. Everybody say, how many want the Word of God to prevail in you? How many want prosperity to prevail in you? Well, I'm telling you, a lot of times, you know, we want to prevail in us, and then we want to do, want to do what it says it to do. To do. I don't believe in tithing. Well, the Bible does. Amen. Hello, I, I used to say, I don't care if you don't believe in tithing as long as you give more than 10%. But I can't say that anymore. I, I, the Lord corrected me for that. He corrected me. Why? Because the tithe is his. And so if you're not calling it the tithe, you're stealing his money to give. Amen. That's like me pledging to Brother Bill, I'm going to give him $500 and then go steal it from Jerry to give it to him. You can't do that. Amen. I can't steal Jerry's money to give the bill and Bill would think I, I'm blessing him with $500 when I stole the money to get it. You can't steal God's tithe to give it back to him. 
Let me make that, probably make a better example. It's like me promising to give Bill $500 and go and steal it from Bill to give it to him. When you take the tithe, you say, I don't believe in tithe anymore, but I'm going to give 15% of my income to the Lord. You say, well, I'm giving 15%. No, because 10% you stole to give from the very one you gave it back to. That goes over real big. God said, when you don't give, when you don't tithe, you're stealing from him. You're a robber. Well, I don't believe in that. I've had people say, I don't believe in tithing. Well, I believe the Bible. I don't believe you. Amen. Hello. And there's all, all kinds of things in people's lives. We're always looking for ways to circumvent what the Bible says because we have a feeling about it or an opinion about it. I am telling you, folks, your feelings and your opinions must become subordinate and subjected to the authority of the Word of God. Say amen. amen. You have no choice in that matter. You have to, if you're going to be a successful believer... If you're going to be successful in business, if you're going to be successful in marriage, if you're going to be successful as a parent, if you're going to be successful in all the arenas of life, you're going to have to subject and subordinate yourself to the authority of the Word of God. Thank you for the enthusiastic response. Because it's still true. <coughs> Joshua, God told Joshua, he said, if you'll keep the Word in your mouth and if you'll do it and observe to do it, you'll be prosperous. You'll deal wisely in the affairs of life. Too often we want to be flies in our own affairs and do it our way and then have, you know, tell Jesus he's got to fix our mess. You know, Lord, bless my mess. Why don't you stop trying to get him to bless your mess and just do it the way he said to do it. It's already blessed. Amen. There's a right way and the wrong way. Amen. Now, how many have ever tried to teach people how to do stuff and they already know how to do it, yet they don't know how to do it? Amen. I know how to do this and you're sitting there watching them. And after a while, you think, let me show you how you do it. Because you don't know how to do it. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Anybody ever done that? Amen. You know? Well, if you'll just let me show you, I can show you how to do it in two seconds. You can spend three hours doing it, beating your head against the wall. I can show you about two minutes how to do it. Boy, it's a whole lot quicker to listen to somebody who knows how to do it. You might stumble upon it in three hours. You might not. You might tear something up in the process. Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Now understand this term, is the personification of the word. Now what does that mean? Remember the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God. The Logos was God. Verse 14 says, and the Logos was made flesh. The word Logos being the word, the Greek word for the word. One of the, one of the Greek words are translated word, but it meaning the whole, the, the whole body. Not just uh, like a rainbow meaning a, a revealed part or an expressed part, but the whole, the Logos. Jesus was the Logos. Logos was with God and the Logos was God. Verse 14, and the Logos was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now what, does, what do I mean when I say Jesus was the personification of the word? He, in his life, his life is a summary of the whole counsel of the word of God. His ministry. When you look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a summarization of the whole counsel of the Word of God. It's not, it's not, every, it's not every last single thing there is, because we have doctrine in the New Testament, but, but his life is a summary. Well, you look at the ministry of Jesus. He taught, preached, and healed. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, we see he didn't, that people that came to him in faith always got their answer. The only people that never got their answer from, that didn't get an answer from Jesus didn't come in faith. What, what, what are you talking about? Remember, remember when the woman with the issue of blood came and touched his garment? Him, he knew immediately in himself that virtue had gone out of him. He turned about in the press and said, who touched me? And the disciples said, Master, thou seest the multitude throng of thee and sayest thou, who touched me? And he, he, but he looking about, uh, looked at the woman, she fearing and trembling, came down, fell before him, told him all the truth. And he said, woman, be, a great, uh, be of good cheer. Uh, thy faith has made thee whole. Now here, remember this, Jesus said, who touched me? And the disciples go, man, the multitude, every, you know, here's what he said, everybody touching you, Lord. That's what he said. Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, now this is old King James, you know, but thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? It's like this, let me kind of modernize it. Peter looked at him and said, Lord, now listen, everybody is touching you, and you want to know who's touching you? 
you need some rest. But what was it that Jesus was really asking? He wasn't asking who touched him. Everybody just bumping all into him, touching him, curiosity. They want to check things out. They, you know, be able to touch the superstar. You know, Jesus the superstar. I'm not going to sing Jesus Christ superstar because it's not really a godly song. Anyway, remember how many ever saw the rock opera Jesus Christ superstar? And you always thought back then when you were unsaved and you thought it was really cool, then you got saved and found out it's so unscriptural, so it's not even funny. You know, I mean, you know, Lazarus betrays him after he's died. I forgot. There was some kind of, all kinds of weird stuff at the end that was just way off. Well, you got dope smokers and acid droppers writing religious operas. They, they get messed up. All right. But it was a good rock opera. Everybody thought, I mean, I'd go to churches. They'd have the, the poster hanging in the Sunday school rooms. Jesus Christ, superstar. He wasn't a superstar. To use that kind of terminology to describe the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, is almost sacrilegious. Because he, he didn't come to be a star. He came to represent and be the outraying and the outshining and the revelation of the will of the Father. To be a reflection of the Father in the earth. And so his ministry, him being the word and the personification of that means that what Jesus did was always a revelation of of what the word teaches so when we see Jesus doing something there is a revelation of what the word teaches in that when he laid hands on the sick to heal them go show yourself how about this go show yourself to the priest and as they went they were cleansed hello be it unto you according to your faith over and the only time we even come close to him <clears throat> Not healing somebody was the woman, whose daughter, the Syrophoenician woman, whose daughter was grievously vexed of a devil. Remember her? And she came to him and said, Master, my daughter laughed at home, grievously vexed of a devil. And, and, and he said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. In other words, he said, it's not right to take that which is the covenant for the children and give it to someone outside the covenant. She said, yeah, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He said, great is your faith. Faith. He had to locate her. She was outside the covenant. Remember, now, remember the difference of the, her and the, and the woman in the temple who was bowed over? Who came to him and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and this woman being bowed over? Fifteen years, he healed her. And the synagogue ruler got mad and said, There are six days in which to work. Let those who need healing come in them. And on the seventh, let them rest because it's the Sabbath. And Jesus said, You hypocrite. You got a donkey that falls in a, a ditch. You'll go get him out. And all, not this woman, because it says that he, he brings it into the covenant realm, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 15 years. Now, if you go study Jewish doctrine, they believe that people were sick because of something they had done. Or their families had done, and it was passed on as a curse. Jesus said the Satan bound her. Oh, not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. What? Covenant. Being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, be loosed on the Sabbath. He didn't, he didn't even try to get, he, she had the covenant right to it. The other woman, he had to get over in the realm of faith because she wasn't in a covenant right to it. So she appropriated it by faith. Glory to God. So, but we find, what do we find? We find in the ministry of Jesus that healing is the will of God. Amen. I'm not sitting in a subject teaching on healing, but I'm trying to show you that Jesus' ministry. So people come, Lord, heal me if it be your will. Go back and see what the personification of the word did. That, that should put you on the path to studying the written word and finding out that it's God's will to heal. It's God's will to deliver. It's God's will to set people free. Man had a son, cast it, the devil would cast him into the fire. Disciples couldn't cast it out. Jesus cast him out, rebuked him. So how about this coming out only comes out by fasting and prayer? What does it mean by fasting? Now you don't have to get together and fast and pray to get the devil out. You need to be in fasting and prayer to be, to be, to be separated to God. Amen. There are not devils that you've got to fast and pray over six weeks to, to get that one devil out. You need to be prepared. Amen. You need to be trained. You need to be in the spirit. Amen. It's, it's you. The power of fasting and prayer does not affect the devil. It affects you. Separates you to God. Gets you in tune with the Spirit. 
Well, some of you, if you have ever read his book, uh, Bitten by Devils, about the girl in uh, Manila, Philippines, that was, you know, in, you know it's, it's, I, I've heard him tell the story more than once in person. You know, remember some of us going home, and I said, you can't do that. You can you see videos or whatever. But I heard him tell it in person a couple of times. And I'm telling you, the hair on the back of your neck would stand up. I mean, it was just one of them stories. That, I mean, devils biting bite marks coming into her flesh while she's sitting there, nothing is in there. Having, having uh, physical relations, a demon, couldn't see anything. I'm telling you, it was it was pulling hair out of that, pulling hair out of something, having it, and nothing in there. But she had hair in her, this hair they couldn't identify. Demon. They put, they put, well, some I was there in, in the Philippines, and they would play her, and they put the um, speaker in the in the jail to record her, and then played over the radio over the whole nation, saying, "Can somebody help us? Can somebody help us help this girl?" And this cries and this and everything just went out. Just they uh, said blood curling. Bro, someone there, he thought, man, I'm going to go cast that devil. He goes, it shows up, walks in, sees this, walks right back out. He knows he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this is outside his pay scale. <laughs> you don't show up cocky. Amen. And he went back and began to seek the Lord. And he got himself separated to the Lord and then began to get instruction from God. He got that. She would disappear. She would be in the, and just disappear and come back later. I'm telling you, it's, it's a, now the church in Manila, Philippines, that, that his son pastored for a number of years, started out of this event. Because they played the whole thing over the radio over the whole nation. Brother Samar was like a superstar hero in the Philippines. Now, he was later recognized in our, in our American courts as an expert on uh, exorcism. So when the, uh, he, he went to many court cases where he had to testify, and he was considered an expert. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a status you get. And when you get expert status and stuff, they, they can't question all your other stuff. When you're, you're considered an expert. And he got considered an expert on exorcisms. And I, I remember him telling, Bitten by Devils was, a, was the name of the book. And uh, <clears throat> that girl got set free, got married, had children. And the church in Manila, Philippines got started out there and still there today. This is back in the 50s. Yeah, I sell that story. You get goosebumps just hearing that story. Uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't that, he, that, that when he went fasted and prayed, that devil was, what, that did something to that devil. When he separated himself and fasted and prayed, it did something to him and got him more in tune with God. It got him less flesh conscious and more spirit conscious. And when he got more spirit conscious, he could hear the voice of God tell him what to do. And the Spirit of God gave him instruction on how to get that devil out of her. He got the devil out of her. I said, he got the devil out of her. Got her set free. I mean, this was witnessed by numerous people. People just standing there and watch this thing happen. They just, it freaked them all out. I'm sure it would. It would freak you out, wouldn't it? I don't believe it. Well, I just, anyway, just. You unbelieving believer. Amen. Amen. Where was that? Oh, Jesus is the personification of, of, of the word. And so we see Jesus cast the devil out of that boy, threw himself down into the fire. I, I got on all that because of, of fasting and prayer. You know, again, fasting and prayer will never make God more powerful. Will never make the devils more afraid. It'll put you more in tune. Fasting and prayer is like fine-tuning a piece of equipment. For you. You're the equipment. And when you fast and pray, you get fine-tuned. And you operate more efficiently. God don't need fine-tuning. Hello. And devils need to be kicked out and destroyed. But you, you, you so fasting and prayer, so how, how about this only kind of come out by fasting and prayer? Meaning it helps you become more sensitive to the Holy Ghost, to the things of God. It, it rids you. It's kind of like spiritual rotor rooter. <laughs> it cleans out all the clogged pipes. Uh, that's probably not an example you wanted, is it? But you'll never forget it. <laughs> Fasting and prayer is like spiritual rotor rooter. It cleans out all the junk that inhibits your ability to flow with God. Yeah. Have you ever had a sink get clogged? Not, just, not your toilet, just your sink. 
You gotta get, you know, you'll, you'll go in there and you'll get the tweezers or whatever, and you'll start pulling that hair and gunk and all that kind of stuff. And it's amazing when you get all that stuff out, the water just flows. Right. Up until then, it's going blue, 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 blue. Why? Wow, it's all clogged up. Fasting and prayer is your spiritual rotor. It cleans your pipes out, so that God, you can flow with God, and be in tune with God. Amen. So we see Jesus coming down and said, the disciples, they couldn't cast the devil out. He cast the devil out. And then said, you, you know, this, you need some fasting. In other words, you need to get cleaned out. Amen. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, expressed image of his person, upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had purged himself, purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus reflects and emulates the will of God in the earth. His ministry. Remember, he said in some places, he said, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, remember, he's the personification of the word. He is a summarization of what the word of God teaches about God. He's not, a, he, he, in other words, we don't have written everything that, if we, if we had to write down everything that he did that would represent everything the word teaches, we'd have the whole Bible over again. And as a matter of fact, there's so many things about him that, that John said that if everything he did was written down, he supposed that the world itself could not contain the volumes thereof. Now, he, I, I think he was deliberately exaggerating. In other words, he did a whole bunch of stuff we don't have recorded. We took the highlights. Amen. We took, we took, we took the highlights that, that represent the embodiment of what he was and he is. Amen. <coughs> so... I like to ask people to do this. When you're, when you're dealing with something in your life and you think you're going to the Lord, he's saying, no, what did happen in the Bible? I mean, they came one time, Peter said, hey, Lord, we got to pay our taxes. He said, go fish. <laughs> we went and caught, the, caught the, the money for him and them. Amen. When they, when they were in trouble in their finances, they just turned to the Lord and he filled up the boats. I, I, we need a boat filler. Amen? We need a boat filler. Glory to God. Now, what we don't need to do is sit down and beat that. We just need to put all our debts in the water. Amen? Now, I'm going to tell you something. If Peter and John and, and those guys had let down all the nets, the good ones instead of the bad ones, because they don't want to have to clean them all again, they had to work around another day in their life. I mean, when Jesus, as soon as Jesus went to the cross, they're, all, they're kind of hanging out. Peter says, I'm going fishing. Going back to the old ways. That's not what the Lord intended. Amen. So let's, let's, as a church, let's say, let's let down our nets. For a draw. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. Glory to God. I'm telling you, when they turned, you know, when they had a need and, you know, and, and they, they loaned the Lord something, he, he blessed them abundantly. Glory to God. Over and over and over again. We find in the Old Testament. You know, this, this is not something new. This is not something new to the New Testament. Remember the Bible? God was still God. He was Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Amen. So when Jesus came, would he not be doing the same thing that God was in the Old Testament? God changes not, and he's God. He made provision when there was no provision. I mean, they got out to a place they didn't have enough to eat for all the people, and he just multiplied a little bit of food, he fed the whole crowd, and had leftovers. Did it twice. One was 5,000. I forgot how many were in the second one. Um, seven, whatever, 12, whatever that was. Yeah, it was just men, besides women and children. And you got to know back in them days, when there was a man, there was a lots of women and the children. If there was one woman for every man, there's, you know, there's a buttload of children. We, can, we, can, we could easily say that the feeding of the 5,000 was probably more like the feeding of the 20 to 30,000. Because there was 5,000 men besides women and children. And if you had one woman and one child for every man, that would have been 15. If you had one woman and two children, that would have been 20. And you know them folks had more than three, two children. Hello. So we, 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 can, we can easily get to 20,000 people got fed. And then had leftovers. Of course, they served Moby Dick and his wife. Because somebody said the, 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 the lows were bigger in those days. Now, can you imagine? That boy had to have tried to try to bring that much food in. Yeah, yeah. Joshua was fish and chips. 
Jesus expressed the will of God in the earth. When we have a penitent, repentive, humble heart. Now, one of the hardest things that we deal with sometimes, especially in pastoring, when you're a traveling ministry, people always give you, give you, give you a pass. You come in, oh, he's a travel minister. And, and I've had travel ministers come in and say something I've been saying for six months. And people go, come at me afterwards. Pastor, Ed, I'm telling you, that was such good preaching today. I never heard it like that before. I just said it last week exactly like that. <laughs> now, I don't tell them that. I just smile because they got it. <laughs> That's all we care about. They got it. Amen. You know? <laughs> and I'm, you're shaking the hand and you're kind of going. What were you doing while I was saying that last week? I was Facebooking. Yeah, Facebooking. We're going to put in dampering fields in here. Hello. Too often, we want to reject something because we don't want to hear it. So how do, you, how do you reject it? What's, you attack the messenger. Ah, that's just Ed. Or you'll get this. I love pastor, but. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he's, he said these things before, but you know, pastor Ed just doesn't, he's, he's not up to date. You know, he's, he don't have the fresh revelation or something along those lines. The Word of God's always fresh revelation. I said the Word of God's always fresh and new. Hebrews says that we are not to let those things we've learned slip. Amen. We should never let them slip. So the Word of God has to be, and, and so if it's coming from Pastor Ed and you don't like it, just go home, get in the mirror, and grab yourself by the collar of your shirt and say, Top! It was Bible. It doesn't matter the vessel that delivered it. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't like that he said that. Sometimes I don't like that I said it either. <laughs> I'd rather not say it. I'd rather say stuff that you all love to hear. I'd rather sing Barney every time we come together. I love you, you love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me. Oh, wouldn't that just be wonderful? We could always come together like that. And then you would never be prepared for battle. Soldier, you're a wimp. Red card. You're making me feel bad. Sergeant's got to go in for counseling for mistreating the recruits. Try a red card on a guy with a weapon who's ready to blow your head off. Try it with the Taliban and see what happens. We're going to behead you. Red card. It's going to be really red when we get done. Hello? I mean, we're, we're, we're training wimps. The Word of God is, you know... Thank God there is encouragement in the Word, but there is instruction in the Word, and there's discipline in the Word, and it is the, the thing we live by, and it's going to challenge your flesh and your thinking. And your flesh is going to rebel. Mine does. Well, I thought you were a pastor. I still got a body. Like right now, if you brought up here 10 pounds of Parker's barbecue and coleslaw and stuff, I would hurt myself. And might even do it right in front of you. Hello, oh, that's good. Hallelujah. Of course, some of y'all would knock me down to get to it, so your flesh would take over. Amen? <clears throat> the Word of God is life to us. That is why we're so strong about its, its authority. That is why we're so strong about teaching it. That is why we're so strong about making these points is your flesh and your thinking has to become subordinate to its authority because it, Jesus personified it and what his will was and, and the word of God teaches us in Joshua, we have to submit and we have to yield to the authority of the word of God whether we like it or not. Amen. Now here's the thing. If you'll submit long enough, you'll like it. 
You'll get to the place that you understand that that is what's been setting you free. That's what's been sustaining you. That's what's been putting you over the top. That's what's been keeping you. That is what's that is going, and I got more to share tonight. We're going to talk about our attitude toward the Word. We're going to talk about how that it's a necessity, not a luxury, how the Word and the Spirit work together. This is Offering Sunday on for the Internet. We want you to know that you can be a blessing to Faith and Victory Church and our work here and around the world. Um, so we want you to know that you can give to us by going to fvc.org. Click on our online tab, and you can give the online giving tab, and you can give right there through our PayPal setup. Praise Lord. Or if you want to mail, mail something, you can do a P.O. Box 7752. That's P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. We just pronounce blessing on you for doing that and giving and helping us carry out the will of God in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address P.O. Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving